folks, I'm uh, Ashley McBride. I'm a technologist at Canos, and uh, I'm by no means a FOSS expert. And uh, I'm not particularly uh, in the open source world or community, but uh, have worked a lot with using open source software and a little bit of contributing. Um, whenever Johnny kindly asked me to present today, I thought it would be interesting to just share what FOSS looks like for me from uh, whenever I started developing code to the services that we deliver today within uh, government, within uh, scale teams and the impact that it had. We have to make quite a lot of decisions through the way that, uh, that are impacted pretty heavily by FOSS and it's changed the way we work quite a bit. So I thought maybe sharing some of the, the lessons and uh, decision points that we make might be quite interesting. Um, some of you might have heard of Tinder before a concept of swipe right, swipe left. I thought I'd try to use that to try to share some of the decision points. So if I like what I see on um, for each of the decision points and uh, think it might be nice to meet that in real life and a pleasurable experience, swipe right. If not, it's a swipe left. Um, what I will say is for the decision points in the scenarios that I'm talking about, they're obviously very specific to me and my projects and uh, the positions I've been in. I think the all, all software and uh, scenarios for false can be just a little bit different, so they need to be tailored for you. I'm going to start by being just a little bit nostalgic, and uh, back whenever I started writing software initially, so 15, 20 years ago, there really wasn't much of a false movement at all. Um, I started coding in university, and in my first ever job in Java, in uh, a bit of VB, that was a big debate then. Are you a Java person or are you a VB person? Maybe a wee bit of C++ in my induction program in Canos as a placement student. Um, and through university, I was, you had to write pretty low level code. And even in those first software projects, so to uh, do proper logging, it was using system.out.println and managing your own files. So it was really sweet whenever I come across the first one of my first ever pieces of open software in Log4j. And it was a revelation that you could, some, someone in their basement somewhere for no value for, or for no financial gain or reward decided to give me this little gem that meant I didn't need to worry about file handling anymore. I didn't need to worry about how to configure, or how, to, how to manage so the logs and let them be invasive into the application. At, at that stage, Log4j was pretty basic. So it allowed you to format some strings and manage the file handling. But the Log4j journey and the, the, I guess the evolution of where it is today is significant and I think it's a real example of where FOSS and the FOSS movement has, has changed and developed. And that if you look at the, how logging looks today, it's, it leads enterprise. There's no way anybody in their right mind would be writing their own logging mechanisms today with the maturity of this software. So with the likes of Log4j, a lot of you probably use it today for, for your projects. It manages your logging in the background. It can form a secondary reporting mechanism. It will log to you absolutely anywhere instead of just some file on my local file system. I guess the, the key learn for me out of this is that that software has really matured, that the FOSS movement has, has I guess, developed a real power. And uh, for me as a developer, I certainly really appreciate that I don't have to do all the legwork. I'm standing on the shoulders of other giants that have, uh, that have built these tools that I get for, for free for my use, for my redistribution, and make my job easier. So that got me interested in trying to seek out opportunities for for FOSS. So in any project I was doing, my automatic reaction, instead of writing a piece of code myself, is to go onto Google or GitHub and try to find what can make this easier. But I came across some challenges very early on, and it felt like in those, certainly those first early years, like it, it was a real job to try and understand IP and copyright. So certainly, I've got my swipe right, so somebody swipe right for Log4j, you got that. Um, but it felt like a bit of a fight against the, the corporate machine of all of my customers felt like 
they, they need their, their software is on the trade secret side of things. Um, whether it's for case management, whether it's for um, insurance processing, that was trade secret software. They did not want any risk in, in the work that we were writing for them. And uh, it's got a sliding scale. So there's, it isn't binary. With the, there isn't a yes, it's, I want to be open, or no, I want to be closed. It's very much open for interpretation, and every customer is a little bit different. And gradually, what I have seen over the years are customers sliding closer and closer to the, the more open end of, end of um, copyright, certainly within their software systems. It's less likely that a case handling type processing is going to be important and a trade secret that they can't share. You're seeing, we're seeing more and more movements within government to move towards being open about being public and uh, supporting us in coding more in the open. Or at least taking a measured approach for maybe some of us in the open, some of us in the closed. But it's a real job to try just to understand where your customer sits on, on this scale. Then there was a million and one, and that's just a selection of the, the licensing options that are available with FOSS software. But there are a myriad of them, and each one has its own set of legal jargon that certainly has a someone that wants to write code and solve pro business problems, I'm not going to understand that. I'm not going to be able to interpret that myself um, without quite a bit of work. So I go to my legal team, or the Kianos legal team, and they give great summary descriptions. But it, it, leaves, you, it leaves you with, um, I guess, a, a bit of risk for every piece of software that you're pulling in. You have to be really careful. Am I, if I use this license with this level of copyright concern, is that going to work or is it not? So you go through and you develop it and you kind of get this Sunday fear feeling. You've brought this software in, you're releasing it, you're going live. And after the fact, it's very hard not to feel like, have I got the right balance there? Have I really understood um, the, the need of the customer and uh, their copyright and interpreted all those licenses? Um, so for me, dealing with uh, licensing and copyright, it's a swipe left, um, not because uh, um, not because the open licenses, licenses are, are not good, they're, they're, they form part of the culture and movement and they're the reason why the FOSS movement has been so strong and made such a difference, but because that's a headache. So I guess my advice or the decision point in all of that for me for any project is I guess more focused on get the right advice, be aware, don't accidentally make that decision. Don't wait until you've got the, the software in and have the, the fear of what did I do yesterday. Do you know, make it a, an explicit decision. Know your copyright and know your IP that, for the software that you're bringing in. Um, then about five years ago, I went to a conference in London, QCon. Might have been a little bit more than that, actually. And for me, it felt like a bit of an explosion of FOSS technology, and I'm not sure, maybe, maybe someone in this room has the answer as to why FOSS exploded really quite quickly a number of years ago, but at that stage, I was introduced to the Elk stack, and uh, around the same time, a number of other tools that are pretty commercial grade. You know, we were, at, this, at that time, I was going into a project that was working with GIS tooling and technology, and uh, the customer were were pretty clear they wanted some of the hardcore Oracle GIS tooling. And uh, it was a pretty positive shock whenever we started doing this investigation into all this open source technology that was available because that's our default answer is can you get it for free and uh, can you do what you like with it? And we found post GIS that gave us everything we needed to be able to spin up a, a data store and have appropriate APIs and we're able to find free tech and uh, open technology that we could put on top of that to display and render all of this GIS information and um, allowing people to interact with mapping technology in a really easy and streamlined way. I think before then I thought of FOSS tooling as little utilities here and there that you pull in for the likes of of logging and little helpers. But it definitely, for me, it definitely changed around that time frame where FOSS suddenly really matured and it, it seemed like actually almost anything that is generic 
in any shape or form, you're likely to find an answer within the false world. And it might not cover your 100% need, but you then can, can tailor it for, for whatever you desire. I've listed a few, but there are hundreds and thousands of tools of this level of maturity that will that, that drive the way we work. So a really good example is the Elkstack, the um, Prometheus, Hadoop, all of that tooling that, that support and have changed the way we think about big data, changed how we manage our log handling, our monitoring, um, proactive reporting. It's, it's a world away from what it would be if there were cost tools, if it was only cost tools, if you had to, to look at commercial software for, um, for, that, uh, for monitoring and reporting in your big data only. I think it would actively restrict what you would do. I think you would be less likely to be as creative within your, within your solutions. I think your customers would be much more limited in what they can do in terms of solving real world problems. So I guess my, my answer to this one is absolutely swipe right and uh, don't underestimate the, the power of FOSS. I think if you go out there looking and think, actually I don't have the money for a license or this is too restrictive in whatever environment you're in, there's likely to be a false answer for it there. You might need to look a bit harder and you might need to do a little bit more analysis just to make sure it ticks all the boxes. But there is a rake of stuff out there. Then I came across my next project. And uh, this project had been running for a year or two before I joined it. And uh, it's a really good example of where FOSS has had a huge impact in the culture within the team, the way every developer worked, and uh, the way the software was architected. So I was trying to get my head around the architecture, the design, what our code looked like, what was our quality, what were our processes, and went looking for the third party components that we had, and I found that multiplied by about 10, I had pages and pages and pages of third party software that had been added into our code base. It was enormous, and we, we weren't a massive team, do you know, we were, we were pretty controlled. So that ultimately, or uh, certainly at the outset, there, that brought a significant sense of fear that I, we have to stand over this code. It's for, it's for sensitive customers with, the, with critical applications, and we have got all of this software that we didn't develop. Somebody else, and um, we don't know who that other person is, we have no contractual obligations with them, we have, we have no commitments from them that this, the communities around them could die, the, the software may not be robust, it may not be secure, but yeah, we, we have it littered throughout our code base. That's, it's hard for that not to be kind of a scary thought. Um, and I guess that's reflective of the culture that across the team, everybody thought, I guess, in a similar way to myself, by default, I'm not going to write code from scratch. I'm going to find something that somebody else has done and I'm going to build on it. So scary as it is, the answer in my world anyway, to try and still make sure we're delivering quality is to build a culture within the teams of understanding that whenever you bring that software in, it, for any third, third party, and it's not that different whether it's cost or open source really, it's just more convenient whenever it's open source is to do that explicit due diligence. So for every new piece of technology that we bring in, you explicitly evaluate it. So you look at all of the factors that give an indication that say, is that piece of software of an equivalent quality to what we would write ourselves? And is it sustainable? So can you see a, a reasonable community built around that technology? Are there lots of people contributing to it? Or is it one person in their basement and we're relying on their technology and the code maybe doesn't look that hot? Um, certainly with the volume that we're bringing in, there's no chance, there's, there's no possibility of expecting our development team to go in and open that entire code base, get familiar with it and be comfortable that if they had to, they would take it over. That's, that's a big ask. Um, so instead we try to get as much information about the environment that we're working within for each piece of software. What's a community? How mature is it? How well used is it across industry? And uh, how well supported is it likely to be? Um, I guess the reality is that uh, for me, certainly, the whenever a community is strong, 
whenever you, you have that support network, that overrides any cost contract you have anyway. So if you're, if you're working with commercial software and you feel nice, like you've got your wee security blanket on, says I've got a contract, you've got SLA, she told me if you had security issues, you'd respond within hours and uh, every bug would be fixed. It's a great security blanket, but the reality <laughs> of how that transpires is it doesn't always work. So yes, you might have a contract, if they, meet, if they don't meet their SLAs, there's a financial implication, but that never really recompenses you for the, the disruption that your technology has to your business. Um, so certainly in comparison, while bringing in so much third party software and uh, less controlled software can seem really quite dangerous, so long as you, we bring it in quite carefully, it, we can be confident that we've got the right processes in place to give us that sense of quality. There are also tools, um, I think there were a couple of shows mentioned earlier on, the likes of Black Duck, um, that uh, will scan your code, look for these third party um, options, will check the licensing model for you, so to avoid the likes of me looking at a big list, manually reading all of the licensing types, double checking if they suit us or if they don't. Um, so there are lots of parties that will scan your code, they will check the licensing types, they'll check if there are any active security vulnerabilities, they'll tell you if there are updates. I guess the challenge is the software around that today is still growing. Most of the, the strength in that software base is in commercial software rather than open source software and it can be really quite costly. So it's a bit of a trade-off to say, well, how, how can you get the best balance there in terms of de-risking? Um, so I'm gonna swipe left on that one because Actually, dealing with the volume is not very pretty and not something I really want to have to encounter lots of, but I'll take the benefits. I want to talk a little bit about uh, community. I think this is, for me, the single biggest factor in our selection process for, for FOSS software. So yes, if we're, so if we're looking for a tool to help us with our or monitoring in production, if we're looking for a tool for reporting, or a tool for um, for logging, you need to check, does it, does it give us what we need functionally? But more than that, I think com community is the number one priority in that selection process. If there isn't a strong community, then you cannot, you can't get that sense of confidence that it actually has been built with lots of eye. The benefit in my mind of, of the FOSS movement and FOSS software is you have a piece of code that if it was developed by the likes of ourselves or any other commercial organisation, you have normal quality check processes. You've got one developer reads it, writes it, another developer reads it, you'll have a, um, automated tests and you'll maybe have some ad hoc or risk-based checking as well. If you've got FOSS software and you've got a full community that's very active, you could have tens or hundreds of eyes looking at a piece of code validating if it works or if it doesn't. But only if that community exists. If the community doesn't, it could be anybody's code and you have no assurances of the quality. Um, the other challenge with community is seeing how well they react, not just to their, their own changes that they want to make, but changes that are proposed. Certainly it's an area that we've had some challenges in, as well as some benefits where we've had big code places that we've brought in and we needed changes for various reasons. We made those changes, we pushed them and uh, tried to add them back into the product and for, in some scenarios, there have been serious time lags where for six months or a year, those, we have the changes, we're using their code base with our changes added on top of that and having to merge those version after version after version as it's been updated in the community but without our, our additions which is really difficult, you know, you just need to know, and a very hard situation to really get second guess, but if you can look at what the community is doing, what their processes are for how they merge code and, and what priority is given, then that's hugely valuable. If you look at the likes of the Java community, it's a really easy example because their process is so mature. They accept quite formal submissions, they evaluate them in the open, and they add them to the product, and that's all really planned really structured, whereas some other communities are much more closed than that and you can't really see what's happening. Where that's the case, it's an explicit decision. Do I, do I take the risk of 
if this community goes away, if all I have in six months' time is a code base, am I prepared to put in the effort to take over that code base and support it myself and deal with whatever level of, of training and documentation exists there? And that's, um, I guess, in everything from skill sets to code complexity. So if you know the language, if you are familiar with the patterns that are used in the technology, then that's easier in some than in others. So community is absolutely a swipe right, so long, so long as the community is there. Um, but the evaluation process, because it's, because it's open, you can see the community, and it's uh, not that tricky to evaluate. Um, so the next area, and I guess quite a contentious one from an open source perspective, is security. So if you're using open source security or open source applications where you don't have that control, is it more or less secure than <coughs> code that you write yourself? Or more or less secure than code that you buy from a commercial organization? I think similar to the earlier point, you can have SLAs as long as your arm work cuts software promises that they will fix every vulnerability um, and uh, that they will give you a code of high quality. But if you can't see that code, how do you know what's happening? under the hood, how do you know how much penetration testing they're doing, how often do they, do they check for vulnerabilities themselves? It's really likely today that for, for any COT software that you're procuring, that actually behind the scenes that COT software is then in turn using open source software, they generally don't build everything from scratch anyway, they'll be forming some kind of wrapper around other technologies. So you're susceptible anyway, even in the COTS world, so in my mind at any time we're dealing with the security question in our applications, we treat the third party applications and the open source applications as if it's our code. So that means that whenever we do penetration testing, whenever we do scanning for vulnerabilities, we do that on the entire application and code base and give a pretty hard security and penetration test to the open source software. For us, the fact that we've had full access to the code has been one of, this is one of the areas that traditionally we are much more likely to be given back to the community within because when we spot vulnerabilities, we fix them and we change it and we, and we do make a difference. Um, for us, uh, that has led to spotting issues that have prevented us from having lots of weaknesses whenever we go live. Um, I guess there's a, an inherent trust in whenever you are writing code in the open, um, you're much more likely to be aware that everybody is looking at your code. And certainly for me, and I know it's part of the, the Microsoft uh, backstory there, is whenever you are coding in the open, you're much more aware that other people are watching and can see, and much more aware of code quality, and therefore that there's an extra layer of inherent discipline, because we all like to be proud of the code that we deliver and the software that, that we put out the door. Whenever that software is really visible, you're much more likely to be careful and clean. Um, So for me, the security is a swipe right from a false perspective, um, just because I like to have control and be able to make my own changes. Um, but it, it does require you, whenever you're doing any kind of testing, to, to look at that big picture and to be aware that you are then responsible for the security of that software. Um, so I guess just to summarize a few points, um, for me, it's all about the explicit decisions. So if you're bringing in any third-party software to your product, explicitly evaluate the community, explicitly evaluate the maturity, explicitly evaluate the security. And it's not just about the functionality that you get today, but how, how good is that going to be in six months' time or in five, ten years' time into the future? Um, understand your own priorities or your, the organisations you're working for, it's priorities to say, well, would they be prepared to take the risk on the IP and the commercials. Um, and uh, certainly would highly recommend, first and foremost, to go for FOSS software if you can find it, because it is incredibly powerful. Certainly my learnings over the years have been, do not underestimate the, the enterprise grade stock software that exists. It's not just the little utilities or helper functions. It's, it's so, FOSS software is leading the, the innovation across 
across technology today. And in my mind, that's because of the community and empowerment that that brings to lots of people. Um, thank you.